ADA 30 Idaho, celebrating the Americans with Disabilities Act. We are talking today with Chris Fulmer, the Community Preparedness Coordinator for the Idaho Office of Emergency Management. Hi, Chris, how are you doing? Hey, I'm well, Jamie. Thank you for having me today. Sure. We just wanted to talk with you a little bit about emergency preparedness. And since you are the go-to guy, we figured you'd be the perfect person. So. Well, I'm happy to help. So uh, my name is Chris Wilmer. I am the Community Preparedness Coordinator um, and Mass Care Coordinator for uh, the Idaho Office of Emergency Management. So we, uh, we lead the state in uh, planning, preparing, responding, and recovering to um, natural and man-made disasters, including uh, the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so you've kind of got a full-time plus job going on right now. <laughs> Job security. Okay, so I've just got a few questions for you. Um, we'll keep this short and sweet, but we really want to get the information. So what are some of the things that you've learned with working with people with disabilities and how has it changed your work? So prior to um, taking this position with the Idaho Office of Emergency Management, I worked for the American Red Cross as a disaster program manager and had the opportunity to go to lots of um, big major very destructive um, disasters, including uh, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico and the campfire in California. And uh, that experience, um, plus what I've experienced here at the state is that uh, many emergency managers, myself included, and first responders uh, just don't understand um, or recognize um, things that could be um, prevent um, independence for the uh, disability community. Um, very difficult to identify those issues. If you don't live with a disability, it's, it's really hard to recognize some of those things that could cause or impede the independence of folks that do. Uh, for example, I, I remember in California, um, we brought in a, a disability integration coordinator to one of the shelters that we had opened. And um, I saw her um, over at one of the doors and she was opening and closing the door several times and I, I was curious so I went and talked to her and she brought it up to our attention that the pressure that it required to open that door um, was potentially uh, so heavy that somebody that was in a wheelchair or relying on a walker or some type of mobi mobility device um, that they would have a very tough time opening that access point point. Um, and it really opened my eyes um, and others in the room, other emergency managers in the room, opened our eyes to some of the things that we just don't consider, um, which I think the number one takeaway from that was the importance of being inclusive in the emergency planning and preparedness process um, and having representation from the disabled community at the table to help us recognize, um, you know, some of those issues that we just take for granted, you know, that we, we wouldn't see, we wouldn't recognize because we don't, um, live under those constraints or have those challenges as somebody with a disability does. That's true. A lot of times if, if it's not something that you deal with every day, you just, um, you don't know. So what are Absolutely. some of the suggestions that you have for individuals with disabilities um, to prepare for an emergency? You know, we, we, uh, we scream this mantra all the time uh, at the state level, at the federal level, FEMA, uh, get a kit, make a plan, stay informed. Those are the very basic tenets of individual and household and family and organizational preparedness. So when we talk about getting a kit, obviously there's special considerations for folks that live with a disability, um, you know, including um, items that help a person maintain their independence, uh, communication devices for folks that um, are deaf or hard of hearing, um, mobility devices for folks that have a difficulty getting around, um, medication, right? So during a disaster, any type of disaster, never assume uh, that medication will be easily available or easily replaced. So we definitely recommend that folks that um, take medication have as a, a, a stockpile of that, have some ready to go that they can take with them because it could be several days or, uh, you know, like we saw in Puerto Rico, several weeks before some of that medication is available. Um, insulin was, was a, a very huge issue 
uh, in uh, Puerto Rico with the power outages. You know, folks had a very tough time preserving their insulin and keeping that cold. So part of the humanitarian relief efforts there was actually delivering ice to insulin dependent um, individuals so that they could keep that insulin on hand and have it. Um, so, you know, a lot of considerations, especially uh, special considerations for that medication. Um, you know, when we talk about making a plan for the um, disabled community, uh, consider the barriers to evacuation, right? What if the power goes out? What if the elevator doesn't work? What if there is an earthquake and the wheelchair ramp, you know, becomes inaccessible or unusable? You know, what if the route that I traditionally use to get to the bus stop or to my friend's house is disabled? So take a look and develop uh, alternate plans or contingency plans for how you would get out of your, your home, how you would evacuate, how you would get to a safe location. Uh, another part of, of making a plan is uh, developing a network. Okay. So knowing folks in your community that you can call and check in with uh, family members, friends, coworkers, somebody that you can check in with and let them know that you are okay or that you do need assistance. Um, we like to have a, uh, to recommend people have a, a contact in the community, somebody close, a friend, family member, whatever, and then also somebody outside of the community that, that can be reached via cell, cell phone or regular phone call. The reason being, um, in the event of a disaster, everyone's trying to make a phone call and it's overloading the cell towers in the local area. Uh, so if you're able to make a long distance call and reach out to somebody outside of your community in a different city or a different state even, um, that cell signal is more likely to get out because it's reaching out to multiple towers instead of just that one tower in the immediate area that's being inundated with phone calls. Um, knowing where to go if an evacuation order is issued, uh, you know, that comes to staying informed. If you don't have friends or family or coworkers you can go stay with, uh, you know, downloading those emergency apps, having a, ba a battery powered radio that's not dependent on electricity, uh, monitoring local news uh, and the state and county social media accounts during a disaster to know where those um, emergency shelters will be or where those evacuation points are that folks can go to and get resources um, and get information as to what's happening and where they should go next. Um, part of that, you know, um, I would also highly encourage anybody um, with a disability that, that finds themselves in a congregate shelter to be vocal and express if there are um, barriers to you maintaining your independence to the staff at that shelter, and whether it's, uh, you know, we partner a lot with the American Red Cross uh, to operate shelters in times of disaster and just making known to those staff that this is an issue that is preventing you from being independent. Um, and I, I promise you that, um, through the Red Cross or through one of the county or state partners, you know, that, that it's something that we take very seriously, that um, inclusion is extremely important to all of us and that we will do everything in our power to, um, to help you overcome that barrier to make it not an issue anymore. So, uh, you know, I would highly encourage um, folks that in the disability community that want to be um, advocates for the community to get in touch with your local emergency planning committee the emergency manager in the county or parish or town that you live in and talk to them and, and um, you know, let them know that you have insight that they don't and that you could be an asset to the planning and preparedness activities in your hometown. Awesome. Thank you. I, and I like having, when you said to have the multiple plans that you now need plans B through Z. So exactly. Yeah. One plan is not going to do it anymore. Um, if, if 2020 has taught us anything, there are, you need plans for everything, apparently. So who would have thought we we're going to have a pandemic? And, right. earthquake and uh, you know, multiple large-scale earthquakes make landfall in the United States, followed by a very destructive wildfire season. You know, it's uh, make a plan for locusts and everything else as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today um to talk about this it's super important information and we appreciate your time jamie it is my absolute pleasure thanks for having me a word collage in the shape of the united states with the word access highlighted and hashtag thanks to the ada